Meteors are called Earth grazers because they make long streaks that seem to come from the horizon itself. The streaks are bit of ice and rock shed by famous Halley's Comet, which passes every 76 years. Next time in 2061, keep looking up. Montana Ag Live is made possible by the Montana Department of Agriculture, the MSU Extension Service, the MSU Ag Experiment Stations of the College of Agriculture, the Montana Wheat and Barley Committee, the Montana Bankers Association, Cashman Nursery and Landscaping, the Gallatin Gardeners Club, and the Rocky Mountain Certified Crop Advisor Program. Folks, you are tuned to Montana Ag Live, originating tonight from the studios of KUSM on the beautiful and vibrant campus of Montana State University, and also coming to you from our homes and offices across the beautiful state of Montana. I'm Jack Reisman, retired professor of plant pathology, and I'll be your host this evening. And before I go any farther, I'd like to repeat some words that Hayden Ferguson, who sat in this chair for a lot of years, used to say, and that is, happy birthday, nope, happy Mother's <laughs> Day, and he'd said that one time too, <laughs> happy Mother's Day to all of you who qualify, and for the rest of you, have a nice day, and that's directly from Hayden for many, many years. For those of you who have watched this program <laughs> in the past, you know how it works. You provide the questions, and we provide the answers. Tonight's topic involves a lot to do with invasive species here in the state of Montana. And we're all concerned about that, and there are a lot of different invasive species that have shown up in the state. So if you have questions about that tonight, please give us a call and we'll do our best to answer them. Let me now introduce the panel. On my left here in the studio with me, social distancing, Jane Mangold. Jane is our noxious weed specialist she likes to be known as the invasive weed specialist. Also, to me, she's a great weed scientist. Joining us tonight is Bryce Christians. Bryce is kind of head of the Invasive Weed or Species Council here in Montana. Bryce does a great job, and it is an important position. He's also a Missoula County Weed Coordinator, so if you have questions tonight, please send them in. Also joining us, Jeff Littlefield. Jeff is a biological weed control expert, but he also is a great entomologist, so if you have some entomology questions tonight, we'll stick him with those too. Jared Beaver. Jared is joining us from Billings. Jared is our Extension Wildlife Specialist, and he'll tell us later on what an Extension Wildlife Specialist does. Answering the phones tonight and the phone number to send those questions in is on the screen. But Nancy Blake will be taking your questions along with Uta McKelvey. Those questions will be relayed to me via technology on this cute little computer I have in front of me. So get busy, get those questions in, and we'll start answering them as soon as possible. But before we do that, Bryce, tell us what you do. Yeah, thanks, Jack. I appreciate the opportunity to come on and talk about the work that the Montana Invasive Species Council does before that, I needed to say happy Mother's Day to my mom, who is who I always call um, when I have a gardening question. Um, but to get back to the council, um, it was established in 2015 uh, to advise the governor's office, um, the Montana legislature and the department heads of Montana's natural resource departments on uh, the best policy moving forward on how we could coordinate our invasive species programs across the state. Uh, we've had a long history of uh, controlling noxious weeds and terrestrial weed species in the state of Montana, but there have been other species coming onto the scene like aquatic invasive species or feral hogs 
Um, and we wanted to make sure that we weren't duplicating effort out in the field and we were able to um, work together across some of those taxa on the different vectors that move invasive species around the state and also help educate the public on just the economic and ecological impacts that a lot of these species have. Um, so the council is made up of uh, just over 20 different members that represent um, state and federal agencies, tribes, uh, conservation groups, private landowners, agriculture, weed districts, conservation districts. Uh, your expert in the uh, studio, Jane Mangold, represents MSU Extension. So we have a, a great group of folks that come together to make sure we're communicating on um, what the, the, the most immediate threats are and also looking um, across our borders of what could potentially be impacting Montana down the road. Okay. We have some questions that have come in through Facebook that we'll get to in a little bit regarding invasive species. Also, we take questions via email, so if you don't want to call a question in, get them in with Facebook or through email. Before we go any farther, last week and the week before and the week before that, we had questions about snake grass in the pasture and also in gardens. And we're not going to get into garden ones because I don't know of a good control in gardens. And this one person from Bozeman has Timothy and orchard grass pasture, very luxurious pasture, but he has horsetail that is increasing and he'd like to stop its spread. Any suggestions? Yeah, so, so snake grass, it's also called horsetail. Um, it's a species of equicetum. And it's that, um, I'm trying to think how to, when you're put on the spot to describe what something looks like, it's hard to do it, but it's that, a real cylindrical vegetation that grows and you can pull it apart. It's segmented, so it pulls apart real easily. It's kind of interesting to think about that being an orchard grass in Timothy because that's pretty aggressive grass, yeah. but this, this snake grass is increasing and it likes wet areas. So um, it is a native species, it likes wet areas and sometimes it just is growing there and you kind of have to put up with it. Um, there are some uh, there are some herbicides. It, it's hard to control with herbicides because it doesn't really have any leaf tissue. It's just this cylinder that kind of grows up from the ground. Um, I this this question has come in you know over the past. Um, actually, I, I had an email conversation with a former extension weed specialist, uh, Dr. Pete Fay, who was on this show a lot of years. And uh, I think Dr. Fay dealt with it on his farm east of town yeah. here. And he shared some information with me. He said that uh, he had good luck controlling it with, I think it was MCPA, the ester formulation. Um, not a lot of luck with the amine formulations. You can also control it with tillage. So if, if tillage is an option, you could get some short-term control with tillage. But it's one of those species that, um, at some point, sometimes you just have to live with it because it's growing in wet areas of your pasture. Okay. So, so we talked before the program what to do with horsetail and asparagus, and we didn't have a good solution, but you said tillage, so dig it up. Yeah, tillage might work, but you're probably going to have to do that repeatedly. Yeah. So I think it'll work well for a season of growth, but then you're probably looking at doing that year after year. Okay, thank you. A uh, question from Malta, and this is for both Bryce and Jared. Uh, number one, they want to know, do we have wild feral pigs in the state of Montana at the current time? And if not, do you anticipate their presence in the near future? Jared, you want to jump on that first? Sure. Um, yeah, and, you know, like you said, Bryce can speak to this as well, is right now no we do not have wild pigs feral swine you know the whichever technical term you'd like to use um, they are very close and they have been spotted um, within 10 miles of the border to our north uh, in canada um, and so that's where the most likely natural concern is for expansion I always like to tell people Montana's growing um, and the people that come here love the outdoors. That's what makes this place so wonderful. Um, so always tell everyone to be alert within the state of Montana because actually the most likely place for a pig to come from is traveling about 60 to 70 miles an hour in the back of a pickup truck. And so 
you know, really the, the threat exists most anywhere. That's how they've expanded in large part across the rest of the, uh, the U.S. Uh, but at the moment, we're pig free and, and Bryce and, and the Montana Invasive Species Council is doing some really great work uh, making sure it stays that way with their Squill on Pigs campaign. All right, Bryce, uh, do you work with Canada and kind of monitor where the feral pigs are at the current time? Yeah, so I'm, I'm glad this question came up and we've been working hard to make sure people are interested and aware that feral hogs could be coming into the state of Montana. The council last year worked with the Invasive Species Council in Washington and then uh, our counterparts in Saskatchewan and Alberta to create a transboundary uh, mitigation plan. So once uh, those feral hogs that Jared was mentioning um, start to come closer to the border, we're, we're working closer together to make sure that everyone's aware where those populations are. And the number that was just up on the screen is really important. Montana's just a huge state with a lot of space and it's really important that we can engage, uh, you know, sportsmen or um, producers or people just when they're out on the landscape. Um, if they see something to just, you know, call Department of Livestock um, they'll have someone out there to investigate it. Um, we've had maybe half a dozen um, sightings through this last year that turned out to be, um, you know, domestic uh, hogs that just tended to be out of uh, out of place. Um, but it's great to have people out on the landscape looking for these things, and so we can get them before they get established. Okay, th thanks, Bryce. I did remember from last year when we had um, this topic on that it is currently, if you do find wild pigs, it's illegal to hunt them in the state or to shoot them. Is there a reason for that? Uh, so I think Jared, just because of his management experience uh, in other parts of the country, uh, could speak specifically to why that's the case. But a lot of the times, um, you're not going to be able to, to get every single one of them. And these animals are extremely smart. And once um, they've had that interaction with humans. They tend to be more um, going out just at night. Um, you're not going to see them during the day. They're going to hide more, and it's going to be harder for uh, Department of Livestock or Animal Services to catch them. Okay, thank you. Um, let's go back to a question from last week, and this is for both uh, Jeff and Jane. The question came in from Bab, and for those people who don't know where Bab, Montana is, Jane will tell you. They want to control you, uh, spotted knapweed using insects because they are on areas too big that they believe they could not spray those large areas. Do, do I get the easy part of the question? Just yeah, kept we'll saying where Bab is? Part. Okay. <laughs> well, Bab is on the east side of Glacier Park, um, north of uh, East Glacier a ways, not too far from the border. And there's a lot of spotted knapweed up in that region. So I can see their interest in biological control. But I'll let Jeff uh, take a stab at the, the biocontrol insect question, and then I can chime in if, if there's anything that Jeff forgets. Okay, Jeff, it's all yours. Uh, yeah, there's a number of uh, agents on uh, spotted knapweed. Uh, and this kind of two complexes, one that attacks the flower heads and the other uh, are root feeders. Uh, the flower head feeders are fairly widespread and I suspect that they're already present up there. Uh, probably the more effective of the root agents is uh, a root boring weevil. It's a fairly large weevil, it's Siphocleonis. Uh, you may or may not have it up there. Uh, there's also a moth called Agapita. Uh, the adults look kind of uh, uh, kind of a triangular, yellow, sulfur color. Uh, they're fairly widespread too. Uh, both tend to be fairly effective up in that area. One problem might be just the weather and how uh, cold it is. They seem to do a little bit better um, in the warmer situations uh, around Missoula. I think they've been fairly effective in uh, knocking back uh, spotted knapweed. Also an option would be to use biological control and um, selective grazing. Uh, the combination of the two, um, if time right, uh, can really knock back uh, uh, the knapweed population, probably more than biocontrol or grazing alone. Okay. Jeff, where do people get these insects if they did want to release them for control purposes? Um, 
there's several options. One would be to go to uh, either your um, uh, county weed office. Uh, sometimes they have sources for them. Um, out of Bryce's office, uh, Melissa Maggio, she's a state uh, biocontrol coordinator. Uh, sometimes she makes collections. There are local uh, collection days that you can go to depending on where you're located. Uh, they're also sold uh, commercially, so you can buy them. Um, sometimes they're quite expensive, maybe a dollar a piece for an insect. Um, and uh, my, my suggestion would be just to go out there and see if you have them already, because sometimes they're fairly widespread. Uh, so before purchasing, um, I would go to. And there's also school groups that rear them. Uh, there's a place up in Flathead uh, High School, I think, uh, that rears them, Whitehall. A number of uh, school groups uh, rear these agents. Okay, you can find that probably online, I'm sure. Where it at least the Whitehall. Um, th sometimes they have linked to other high school groups. Yeah. Okay. I would uh, just add, uh, Jack, that Jeff mentioned the Montana Biocontrol Coordination Project. Right. And Melissa Maggio was on here, I think, yes, a yeah, year or two ago. But the website there is, M if I remember right, it's mtbiocontrol.org. And uh, she has a lot of resources there about where you can, the commercial uh, commercial opportunities or collection days. So that's a great resource to check out, mtbiocontrol.org. Right. Thank you. Uh, Jared, this question came in last week. I gave him my two cents worth, which isn't worth much. So we're gonna go to the expert. This is from Phillipsburg, uh, in Granite County. This person believes they have badgers that are burrowing under their buildings. They would like to get rid of them, quote, humanely. So any suggestions there? Yeah, um, and I appreciate the kind words on, on the expert, but I'm not an expert in anything. It's, <laughs> it's usually the first thing I tell folks. But um, I, I would be very surprised if it's a badger. They're typically a very elusive and shy species. They do not tolerate human presence very well. Um, so the, the key part I honed in on that was it was near structures or buildings. Um, and so if there's any sort of human presence, it's, it's most likely a marmot. And in Montana, there's three species of marmots, um, the yellow bellied, the hoary, and the woodchuck. And the, the woodchuck typically does really well around structures and buildings and, and people. Um, so control would, would most likely be what you would typically recommend for that. And so trapping uh, would typically be uh, the best solution and you can either live trap to some sort of like tomahawk or have a heart um, or um, conibear body gripping traps would be the most humane uh, reason there but um, if you're using that sort of control you need you need to make sure you know exactly what the animal is confirm it's marmot uh, and make sure that there's no risk for any sort of bycatch okay so. thank you i think that was an expert answer if you asked me I definitely made a guess last week, and I was probably partially correct, but not completely. So thank you. Uh, Jeff, this is an annual question. We're going to answer it one more time this year. Slugs in a garden, it seems to be increasing. We've had several questions from around the state. Your take on what to do to get rid of slugs. Uh, for one thing is uh, you, you probably can't get rid of slugs. You can kind of manage them. Um, I think uh, probably over the last few years, we've had uh, wetter springs and that's really conducive to uh, slug populations. Uh, they really like to uh, hide under mulch and uh, uh, plant debris. Uh, so uh, some of the options might be uh, to really manage your mulch, uh, turn it over or get rid of piles that you're not using. Um, you can adjust uh, watering in your garden uh, it's, uh, to water maybe more in the morning rather than the evening. They tend to be more active during the night, uh, seldom seen during the day. Uh, there are trapping methods you can use. Um, they can be quite simple. You can buy slug traps that uh, uh, might have baits in them that you can attract and get rid of the slugs that way, or you can put out little uh, slabs of, of like tile and uh, 
pick them up in the morning and pick the slugs off and just kind of manually uh, remove slugs. There's also uh, barriers you can put up, uh, keep them out of say raised beds or, or garden areas. These are copper, copper strips and they have to be wide enough to, um, uh, to prevent uh, larger slugs from crawling over them. And there's also chemical treatments you can use. Um, metaldehyde is a, a fairly effective chemical, but it's really toxic, uh, especially around pets and, uh, and, and children. Iron phosphate is a lot more benign and also can be effective on slugs. Um, there are also baits you can use. Um, a typical uh, bait would be to put out a pan with uh, some beer. Uh, you can buy a cheap can of beer for your for the slugs and a good can of beer for yourself. So uh, <laughs> those uh, are some of the options that you have to control slugs and you have to be more or less persistent in trying to manage them. And some of these slugs are uh, live over several years as well rather than a single generation. Okay, thank you. And now we know how to control slugs. And I will say, I mentioned this before, Kansas State years ago had nothing better to do than to test which beers work best for slug control. And I'm not sure where that was published or if it was, but uh, one of our previous entomology professors referred to that years ago. Uh, Bryce, this question comes from Shelby. And I know a lot of people are interested in this topic. What is the current status of the invasive mussels here in the state of Montana? You want to? Yeah. So, yeah. Uh, so right now we only have one positive water body um, for zebra quagga mussels, and that is Tiber Reservoir. So pretty close to Shelby there. Um, those mussels were first detected four years ago, um, and um, they have not been detected since. Um, one more year we have to go um, with uh, negative testing to declare that water body muscle free. So hopefully after this season uh, we'll be a muscle free state once again. But it, it's really critical for us to prevent um, the, the spread and establishment of, of those species in particular in Montana because our control options are extremely limited. So prevention is really where our focus is and that's why we see um, so much focus and emphasis on our uh, watercraft inspection stations across the state, making sure that we don't have contaminated water uh, craft coming into the state of Montana and potentially infesting our waters. Okay, and you're speaking of checking watercraft, recently there's been a lot of news on float planes coming and going from water bodies outside the state of Montana. How are those monitored? Yeah, that's a great question. So the, the float plane uh, folks have been really engaged. They understand that they have the potential to move um, mussels um, just as much as any other watercraft could. So they, they have been working with the council and other groups across the West to um, create protocols that work for them and for the agencies responsible for managing them to make sure their planes are clean and that they're not moving anything around. So they've been a, a great group to work with and have been super engaged in, in the mussel issue. Okay, and while I have you up, another question came in from Manhattan. They want to know whether or not migratory waterfowl could be a vector of the invasive mussel. Um, I think it would be extremely, ex extremely rare for that to happen. I, I, I can't say with certainty that it, it's impossible. Um, but for the most part, these mussels attach to hard substrates in water that are um, not moving around to, to make their home. And so it would be very rare for them to attach to a, a li another live organism like, a, um, like waterfowl and, and be moved from one water body to another. Okay, thank you. Um, yeah. Hopping over to Jane from Miles City, uh, what's the best way to control wild growing horseradish? And can you use wild horseradish for horseradish? You know, I'm not sure what they mean by wild horseradish. I'm not sure either. So, I didn't know we had it here. Yeah, I didn't either. So um, 
I really don't want to give a recommendation without knowing for sure what it is, and I definitely would not recommend eating it when we don't <laughs> yeah, know for it, sure it, what it is. <laughs> so why don't they send a sample of it in, and we'll find out what wild horseradish is, yeah. and next time Jane's here, yep. she'll yeah. let people know. So I would encourage the person to first take it to their local extension office, and if the, the county agent can't help you, then it will make its way to campus, and we'll get an identification of that. Okay. Plant, so we know for sure. Thank you. Uh, question, another question from uh, Manhattan. This refers to the uh, Eurasian collar dove. Is that an invasive species? And Jared, if so, uh, is it a damaging species that you're aware of? Yeah, that that's a good question. Um, you know, I'll, I'll have to get back on the actual control part of uh, for that particular species, but at, at the moment, um, there's not like a particular invasive concern um, with it. Um, you know, obviously, when you're talking about different species and, and competing, um, you know, there's there's always that aspect where they can start to fill in niches um, and and push other species out and kind of that, um, you know expanding aspect of where they can, you know, fill in with, with other animals and, and the insects and, and all that. Uh, so I'll, I'll have to circle back on, on that particular question. So. Okay. I, I really find it kind of interesting to me, and Bryce, you can jump in a, in a moment here, but uh, game and fish has not uh, classified them as a game bird. So if you want to hunt them, you can hunt them year round and there are no limits on them. Um, to me, they do provide another hunting opportunity for the state of Montana. What's your opinion, Bryce? You're an invasive specialist. Um, so these are the kind of questions that the council really likes to get from the public. Um, there's a lot of species that get moved around, um, you know, all over North America. And if you're starting to see a species that seems to be, um, you know, displacing uh, native wildlife or, or native animals that you typically see in those areas or you're just starting to see a lot of something in a place that you didn't see it those are questions that we like to get and then we can try to track down the experts on those issues and see you know are is there an invasive species concern here is there either an ecological or an economic impact that, that we should be working to mitigate so uh, we definitely invite the public to to work with us on on those types of questions Okay, appreciate the answers, May, folks. Could I ask yeah. Bryce? Bryce, um, I don't know if you planned on meant talking at all about our uh, science mm -hmm. advisory panels. If this would be, this might be a good opportunity to talk about those in in light of an unknown species like the collared dove. It's really yeah. Increased. So, um, uh, one of the tools that the council has been able to utilize over the last couple of years are science advisory panels. And that's really when we get a question like this, either from uh, an agency or members of the public, um, we work to invite a panel of expertise from uh, either around North America or even internationally in our last one. And a great example of that is uh, the last science advisory panel that we hosted was on Eastern Heath snails, which is a terrestrial land snail uh, up in the belt area that's been up there for quite a while, but certainly is not a native species. And um, in other parts of the world, similar species like uh, in Australia have caused significant impacts to um, their agriculture um, and commodities industries. So um, one of our panelists actually was Jeff Littlefield who over the last couple of years has become, I think, uh, one of the leading international experts on that species. Um, um, so it, it was a great opportunity to try to bring that expertise to Montana and try to answer a question like that on whether or not this is a species that we need to be concerned about. Um, if it is, what do we do about it? Um, so we can start to work through a lot of those questions, both with um, you know stakeholders and with the experts that would be working on them. Okay, thank you. And I do have a question that came in about 10 minutes ago about the heath snail. Jeff, they would like to know what type of damage does it cause to crops? And number two, how widespread is it in the belt area? Uh, to answer the first, uh, the last question first, um, 
uh, some surveys uh, conducted back in about 2012, 2013 by APHIS and the Montana Department of Ag found the snail probably over an area of uh, 110 uh, square miles. So it goes anywhere from Highwood all the way down to uh, Monarch uh, kind of patches. I think there are uh, some of our uh, subsequent surveys indicate that maybe it's a little bit larger area. So they're fairly widespread, uh, not only along the Belt River corridor, but up on some of the benches that have uh, wheat productions as well. Uh, what they feed on, that's part of what are, we're doing in Bozeman, looking at the biology of it, uh, looking at what they feed on. So. Uh, out in the field, you can find them on probably about 30 different plant species, different uh, plant families, about 15. We've been doing some lab tests. Uh, they seem to really like uh, to feed on legumes. They do quite well on sweet clover, peas. Uh, they do feed on wheat and barley uh, to a lesser degree. Um, they probably have a fairly wide uh, diet, nibbling a little bit on this and that, uh, feeding on dentritus, um, uh, dead, dead material. They probably feed on that quite a bit. Out in the field, you don't see a lot of uh, impact associated with them, uh, a little bit of nibbling. Our greatest concern is, uh, Bryce had mentioned the problem in Australia with a similar type of snail or snail complex. Uh, they've gotten into their wheat, uh, caused problems with harvesting, export issues. They've gotten in canola, become a quite uh, uh, damaging pest on canola. And that's uh, fairly a recent uh, shift in, in feeding behavior, maybe due to climate changes. Um, They've been present probably in Australia for a hundred years and only over the last 20 years, they've made a shift where they're more economic. And that's the concern that we have in Montana that they'll start shifting, uh, getting into legumes, alfalfa, um, becoming more damaging. Okay, thank you. You know, I have seen snail damage years ago and we used to have some uh, cooperative USAID project in Egypt. And they do a lot of damage to barley at that time they basically uh, destroy the flag leaf when they got on it. So I don't know if that would happen here, but I'm glad you guys are working on it. Uh, back to Jared. <laughs> a couple of things, Jared. First of all, we have a question from Billings. Uh, this person would like to know your phone number and office address so they can contact you regarding some problems they have. And also from that area in Huntley, this person grows sweet corn and they have raccoons. And they say, help me. You might explain what's going on there. Yeah, so um, raccoons have been kind of an increasing growing problem uh, in Montana. Um, and the reason for that is is they thrive very well um, with human growth and disturbance. Um, raccoons, you know, where you have raccoons, you have a food source. Um, and, and corn is an excellent food source or you know, other growing crops. And so, um, yeah, so, you know, that's that's kind of a common theme across most agricultural landscapes and, and where you have that kind of um, agricultural and urban and growth. Um, in terms of control, um, you know, trapping it and, and shooting uh, really is, is going to be uh, the most effective control in those circumstances. Um, in terms of my contact information, uh, I believe there there may be an image or something that can roll up across the bottom. But um, uh, my name Jared Beaver at Montana Edu, um, and then there'll be an office an office line associated with that, um, which will also transfer directly to my cell phone when I'm out of the office. But um, yeah, the raccoon problem is is you know it's going to take some effort. Um, they're they're pretty. Um, prolific uh, in terms of breeding and existence for those food sources. Uh, they also really do well um, in kind of wet uh, riparian areas as well. And so um, it, it's just been a growing problem as kind of land uses have changed in Montana. And so it's probably something we're going to see more of. You know, I grew up in the Midwest where you always try to put a patch of sweet corn in the middle of your field corn. And about the time it was getting ripe, 
the raccoons would attack. And they wouldn't just take one or two ears. They take one bite out of every ear, so they pretty much <laughs> destroy it. My dad, bless his soul, rigged up a wire, hot wire, about three inches off the ground. And that worked for about two years. But then they learned how to jump over the top of it. So you're right. It's a t <laughs> tough question to answer. Uh, Jane, question from Bozeman. They have what looks like a big dandelion in their pasture with a large fluffy head. They want to know what it is and how do they get rid of it. Yeah, that's probably uh, Western Salsify, Tragopogon dubious, for those of you that like scientific names. Big yellow flower, and yeah, it gets the big puffy dandelion later in the summer. Um, I actually pulled, I actually dug some of these from my yard today. <laughs> um, it looks like grass when it's in, uh, before it flowers. Um, it just looks like a little tuft of grass. And if you break any of the leaves, you get a white milky sap. So this is the time to, this is looking pretty limp and uh, wilted now, but this is the time to control Western Salsify. And if you treat it with 2,4-D plus dicamba at this growth stage, when it, when it looks like a grass, um, you can get pretty good control with it. Now, interestingly, there's a, we're always talking about new invasive species. There's another species that looks similar to Western Salsify. It's called um, cutleaf viper grass. And I'm not sure what I actually have in my yard. I think I had, I think I have two different species, but this also looks like Western Salsify, only it's, it's got more um, kind of cobwebby hairs at the base of the plant. And that's why I think that might be what I have here because I don't know if you can see that in the, the camera, but there's some cobwebby hairs. Um, this is a species we don't know a lot about. Uh, Utah added it to its noxious weed list a couple years ago, and uh, you know people are watching this one, kind of trying to figure out what it might do. But um, what I have seen mostly in Montana, in this area of Montana, in the Gallatin Valley, is the western salsify. Okay, I have plenty of that. Yeah. And it it really does spread quite easily. It produces a lot of seed. Yeah. Uh, Jared, a question, uh, follow up from the raccoon just came in from Miles City. This person drives a truck throughout the Midwest and he says he sees a fair number of flattened possums on the road and he's never seen any in Montana. Do we have possums here? And if not, why not? Yeah. And yeah, I'm getting getting some of these miso predators. That's a little bit out of my wheelhouse. I'm kind of a large mammal guy. And so um, you know, it, it has to do with, you know, the niches and, and, and kind of the voids uh, that they fill and, um, you know, to get a, a fully correct, you know, answer with that, I'd have to explore that one a little bit more. Um, you know, like you said, it, it's not an issue we, we get a lot here. So I don't know if I have a really good answer for that question. I don't either, but I've never seen a possum up here. I haven't either. Uh, I have seen them in southern Wyoming, so maybe they're moving this way. Bryce, watch out for possums. It may be an invasive species. Uh, we'll add it to the list. <laughs> okay. Uh, Jeff, uh, Facebook question. They would like to know, will the murder hornet survive in Montana, and do you anticipate it becoming a pest? And that comes from Libby. Um, yeah, I guess uh, just recently, last uh, fall, they have picked up some um, what the terminology murder hornet or murder murder wasp they're uh asian giant hornets they're a uh, fairly large hornet maybe about two inches uh, in length uh, have a really bad sting uh, picked up some colonies in washington and vancouver island uh, that they try to eradicate um, if they become established uh, i've seen some models of trying to predict uh, where they might spread to in uh, the Pacific Northwest, and they probably can spread into Western Montana. Uh, they tend to be in colder areas in Asia, Japan, um, and tend to like uh, to make their nests in rotted uh, pine stumps. So uh, 
maybe Western Montana is not the most ideal climate for them, but they are t capable of surviving. If they do make it here, um, there's big concerns about them stinging people and causing deaths. Uh, in Asia, that's uh, been really, there's been some deaths reported, um, probably not much more than any uh, honeybees. Most of the uh, deaths are related to um, uh, uh, allergies associated with bee stings, but they do have a bad bee uh, sting to them. The main concern is that they tend to rob uh, honeybee nests and can wipe out the colonies uh, fairly rapidly if they have large numbers. So the main concern is with the honeybee uh, industry on those. Okay, yeah. and the Washington Invasive Species Council has um, some really good resources on identification for um, those, uh, those hornets. Um, so just, you know, the, the Montana Invasive Species Council has definitely been interested in that issue. And uh, it's been nice having our counterpart in Washington so engaged on that issue and providing us information as, as that develops. You know, I've been told through my education many, many moons ago that once the species arise, it becomes pretty hard to eradicate the species unless you eradicate the host. And so my own opinion is, is the murder hornet is going to be here to stay, but I don't think our climate here is going to be that conducive, hopefully. And I've been wrong before. So, uh, Jane from Bozeman. This person is hiking on trails around town and wants to do her part in controlling noxious weeds by pulling them, but she can't do all of them, and I appreciate that. She would like to know what are the three top noxious weeds that she should focus on pulling oh. here in the Galton Valley. Yeah, I that, know one of them. That's a great kudos to her yes, for wanting to do something, and we should all be doing that when we're out enjoying our trails because... Um, we move weeds around and they like disturbance, just like Jared was saying, you know, with raccoons, they kind of like disturbance. And um, gosh, the three species in this area, in the Bozeman area, I would say spotted knapweed. That's a, well, let me step back a minute and just say that the, when you're, if you want to hand pull a weed, you kind of want something that has a tap root and you can get that whole plant out of the ground. Right. Um, versus something that creeps and crawls and you know you might pull one stem but you don't kill the plant. So I would say spotted knapweed, um, that's a good one to pull. Uh, hound's tongue. That's my favorite. It's my favorite <laughs> to pull, especially um, I just noticed some this weekend. It's you know popping out of the ground about right. this tall and the ground is nice and moist so it's a great time to pull that. And then um, let's see a third one. Oh, another good one in this area is Horiolissum. That has a taproot, um, and you could pull that. Um, I'm probably missing another important one. You got two but... of my favorite three. So. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, and I do appreciate that people are taking time to pull some weeds. It, it's not the only answer, but it does help. Yeah. Uh, Bryce, uh, from Billings, this person heard on NPA, NPR, National Public Radio, that the National Invasive Species Awareness Week is coming up. You want to say anything about that? Yeah, so uh, the National Invasive Species Awareness Week is actually um, starting in, in just a week now, uh, May 15th through May 22nd, and the focus is on outreach and education. And so the council will actually be uh, launching an ad campaign um, highlighting the different outreach and awareness campaigns that are uh, active in Montana from uh, Play Clean Go, um, which just um, uh, advocates that you clean all your equipment, um, your ATV, uh, your boots, your fishing gear, whenever, um, so you're not transporting organisms from one area to another, um, all the way to the Don't Let It Loose campaign. A lot of our invasive species come from people accidentally um, or not meaning to introduce an invasive species, but um, you know, getting uh, a cute um, little turtle that turns into a big um, snapping turtle that gets too much to handle and then taking it to the river or the lake and, and letting it go. So um, there are a number of uh, education awareness campaigns that we'll be pushing. And so you'll see ads and banners on the various newspaper websites. Uh, so trying to make sure people know how um, 
how they should dispose of pets, how they should clean their gear, and what they should do to make sure that we're, we're limiting the amount of spread that we have for invasive species in Montana. Appreciate it. Thank you. Uh, Jane, and this is another one of our annual questions. I won't ask it again this year, and if I'm not here, I'll tell whoever's here not to ask it again. <laughs> this person would like to know, is there a way to keep quack grass from taking over their yard? Oh, yeah. I thought this is either going to be quack grass or field bindweed because <laughs> okay. we get those every year. Um, yeah, and I think a couple weeks ago we had a quack grass question, but we were we tried to answer it at the very end, and I think I just kind of threw my hands up and said, too much Wait. to, yeah. Um, well, yeah, so quack grass, you know, we just were, talk, we were talking about prevention and the importance of prevention. I would say that when quack grass first starts showing up in your yard, I mean, that's when you really need to try to do something about it. If it gets to be too pervasive in your yard, it's, you know, it's very hard to get rid of. Um, one thing that I have done um, in my own yard, because uh, I had just started having some quack grass show up, is I actually... Um, got out my little uh, brush. There, there's a photo of some quack grass in my yard. Yes, I do have weeds in my yard. But what I did with that quack grass was I actually just um, used this little uh, brush. It's one of these little foam paint brushes. And I got my latex gloves out. And I just dipped this brush in some glyphosate, ready to use glyphosate. And I brushed it on that quack grass. And what was really nice about doing that right now is I, had, I haven't mowed my lawn yet. And the quack grass is growing taller than the Kentucky bluegrass in my lawn. And I just used this little wand and, you know, I brushed it on those leaves. You can see there that those leaves that got the glyphosate are turning brown, but the grass around it is not. And, you know, I didn't get it all in that picture, but I, I do plan to be um, getting out there again, probably when we get some warm, sunny weather again and brushing that on again, again, just kind of using one of these foam paint brushes is what I used. And you know, you, obviously you want to use some latex gloves when you're doing that. And that works well, I agree. And it works well in flower beds and yep. um, juniper beds, so forth. But if you got an acre of quack grass. Yeah, and that's what I said. I mean, this is, you know, you gotta, you're doing something like this when you're first noticing something show up. and. You know, just the importance of all these invasive species, if you will, just the importance of prevention and f detecting or finding something early and managing it when it's still manageable. I mean, that's one of the main goals with, with Ma Montana Invasive Species Council and all the species that we talk about is the importance of prevention and trying to take care of something before it becomes a widespread problem. You know, and that's, that's interesting because this question just came in from Reed Point, and they would like to know that some invasive species turn out to be positive. Bryce, Jane, you guys want to address that? Is that true? Um, so I think it's important to say that we have a lot of introduced species that are important. I mean, a lot of our crops are introduced species. Um, invasive species are really when it comes down to an economic or ecological impact. So I would say that we probably don't have any invasive species that do turn out to be beneficial. I think we certainly have questions about some of those species when they show up, but really it's our job um, to assess those species and make sure that, that there's not a negative economic and ecological impact. And um, if they do, um, I think it's also important that the tools that we use to control them also don't cause more harm than, than good. So making sure that the cure is not as, as bad as the, I don't know what the rest of that phrase is, but you know what I mean. <laughs> okay. Uh, we do have some species that were, were intentionally introduced for a beneficial purpose and have become invasive. And Russian olive is a great example. So, you know, Russian olive is a, a great tree in shelter belts where it's in drier areas. It, it's one of the few right. trees that will grow. But when it gets into riparian areas, it becomes invasive. So that's another important point about an invasive species is there are certain habitats where some of these species are more of a problem than in other habitats. Yeah, good point. Absolutely. Yeah, uh, I just want to add, Jack, that uh, with the biocontrol, um, pollinators are a major issue now that some of these uh, uh, invasive weeds uh, provide uh, pollinator uh, services to bees and such that. So there's a lot of concern there with biocontrol that you'll be wiping out that uh, 
uh, source of uh, nectar and, and pollen for bees. So um, uh, spotted knapweed is, is an example of that. Um, yeah, interesting point. Uh, thank you. Uh, Jared, and I'm surprised this hasn't come in before now, but this came in from Joliet. They would like to know the current status of chronic wasting disease, which if you're an outdoorsman or a hunter in this state, you've heard of chronic wasting disease. You want to tackle that? I can. And, um, you know, obviously I'll reference, you know, the, the state agency. They have a really good staff there that uh, is, you know, um, really onto that problem. Dr. Jennifer Ramsey uh, is a vet with um, uh, Montana uh, Fish and Wildlife and, and an excellent source of information. But yes, uh, CWD is, is very prevalent right now in Montana. Uh, in fact, um, it, last number I saw, it was at, I think, at least 26 states um, in the U.S. Um, I, I see it becoming, you know, a, a very large um, concern. You know, I, we could spend a whole show on, on chronic wasting disease. Um, you know, briefly, it's it's a misfolded prion that replicates. It's it's 100% fatal. Um, you see it, um, you know, the observable signs it takes you know it can exist in an animal for up to two years before you see physical signs where uh the animal uh looks malnutrition and confused and um but it, it presents itself typically in older males and so um a common way to reduce the prevalence in an area is start to tackle kind of that older male structure in a population and you know, within a state that really loves hunting and, you know, uh, a population that, you know, you know, that typically be comes to more favorable or desirable, um, you know, animal from a hunter standpoint. And so it's really a tough um, to tackle uh, from a public standpoint is, you know, you typically get a little pushback when you're advocating to take more of an animal and typically the more desirable aspect uh, of that animal uh, for the long term and, and more beneficial good. Um, so I don't know if that directly answered their question, but CWD is, is certainly a growing concern and, and we're just going to have it. Um, it it's going to be a problem that we're going to face, you know, uh, in perpetuity. Great answer. I agree entirely. Uh, Jeff, a Facebook question. Do biocontrol agents that attack Russian knapweed also attack spotted knapweed, or are they two different uh, biocontrol agents? There's the two different complexes. Uh, none of the spotted knapweed agents will attack Russian knapweed and vice versa. So um, they're uh, genetically dissimilar. Uh, even though they're called knapweed, they are actually in different plant genera. So different con biocontrol complexes. Okay, thank you. Uh, everybody can jump on this one. A another Facebook question actually from Shoto. They heard of a thistle rust that is viable, that is a viable method of controlling Canada thistle. Uh, any comment on that, anybody? I can chime and take a first stab. There's a, a rust, it's Pachinia. I'm gonna forget the specific name, but it is a, a rust that uh, decreases the vigor of Canada thistle. There's actually uh, research going on here in Montana that uh, MSU is working on along with uh, Melissa Maggio with the Montana Biocontrol Project. Um, maybe some others that I'm missing, but um, yeah, it's a, it's a kind of, it's an organism that's been around a while and been investigated as a, a pathogen for controlling uh, Canada thistle, but we've learned some new things about how to inoculate it and how to make it more effective. So if anyone else wants to add anything that I've missed. Nice. Jeff, you want to jump in? Uh, yeah, the rust is fairly widespread. They have different types of spores and also have a systemic infection where it gets into the roots and can go from plant to plant. Uh, the main problem has been trying to uh, to use it as a microherbicide is finding the correct spores to use. And uh, a 
plant pathologists with the USDA found that spores that are produced later in the fall or late summer um, are better spores to use to inoculate plants. So basically they collect plants at that time, grind them up and basically uh, sprinkle them and, and put them on plants. And from what I understand, uh, they've had some fairly good success um, knocking back uh, Canada thistle populations. How persistent the rust will be after that is, is uh, up in the air, so it'll be interesting to see. Okay, thank you. Well, I have you up, uh, a question from Polson, and we're running low on time, so a quick answer if possible. Are there biocontrol agents for white top, and if so, where can they get them? Um, yeah, uh, I'm working with a uh, gall mite, uh, Asteria drabi, for white top. It's the first agent that's been approved for white top. Uh, being up in the Polson area, you're in kind of white top central. Uh, the mite primarily causes uh, gall formation up in the flower heads, causing it to look a little bit like, like broccoli. So if you hate uh, white top, uh, now when it turns into broccoli, you'll hate it even more. Um, <laughs> How effective it's going to be, I'm not quite sure. It will reduce uh, seed production um, in certain cases, uh, stunt the plant. We've just made some releases over the last couple of years and have it recovered. Uh, so it would be interesting to see what sort of impact there is on, on white top. There are a, a couple of other agents in Europe that they're studying, a, a gall weevil and another flower uh, seed pod weevil that uh, we hope to bring in in the future for white top control. Okay, thank you. Jane, five seconds. Uh, bread the straw control. Pull it. Pull it. <laughs> what if you got a lot of it? Spray it. 24D. 24D. <laughs> okay, folks, that brings to close another session. I want to thank our guests this evening. It's great to have them here. The Invasive Weed or Invasive Species Council is really important in the state, so support them. Next week, we have Mark Jensen with the Smooth Honey Company talking about the Montana Beekeepers Association. It'll be fun. Join us. Have a great week. Good night. For more information and resources, visit montanapbs.org slash ag live. Montana Ag Live is made possible by the Montana Department of Agriculture, the MSU Extension Service,